In order to have a better understanding on where Hong Kong's goals and gaps are in terms of the city's aging population situation, we would like to invite Dr. The Honorable Lam Ching Choi, Chairman, Hong Kong Elderly Commission, HKSAR Government, to share his views in a presentation titled Inclusive Urban Design Built for Health and Mobility. Dr. Lam, please. Thank you very much. I believe all of you have a very good lunch in uh, Happy Valley Race Course, right? So, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry that I uh, uh, being excused uh, this morning. I know that uh, you have a very uh, interesting and fruitful discussion. And uh, actually, uh, uh, that excuse is a pretty good excuse because uh, this morning I attend another workshop on uh, intergeneration co-living housing arrangement. So, uh, but anyway, I will touch on it a little bit. And <clears throat> uh, this is uh, today's uh, my agenda. Uh, in formulating urban design, uh, the demographic trend of the city is one of the essential considerations, so I will address on it. And in response to the aging population in Hong Kong, the city should be built to promote better health and cater for people for various degree of uh, mobility. And uh, Kampon MOT in Singapore will be introduced to uh, illustrate the concept. And I know this morning uh, my Singaporean friend has uh, discussed on this, so we'll have a double dose. So we'll see a Hong Kong perspective on a Singapore uh, project. And to drive system change in the city, uh, policymakers are obliged to stick to the original purpose of urban planning. With this in mind, we shape the environment and people's behavior will be shaped by the environment subsequently. And this is uh, my argument uh, for today's uh, talk. And according to the Hong Kong population projections, the size of the elderly population will increase uh, sharply, uh, rising uh, from 1.2 million now to 2.5 million in 26.4. Uh, the figure just quoted by Burnett, my colleague in the Executive Council, is incorrect. Uh, so uh, not, not so soon, uh, one in three will be elderly. Uh, actually, it will be a bit uh, later. But anyway, it's a very steep curve. Actually, uh, according to many statistics and compared with other economies, uh, the aging trend in Hong Kong is expected to be amongst the fastest in the world. And with an increase in life expectancy and the baby boomers approaching old age, the number of OOs, means those beyond the age of 85, will grow much faster than other cohorts uh, of the elderly people. And mind you, by that time, uh, many scientists uh, predict that human beings can easily live beyond the age of 120. So uh, this projection may well be an understatement. So, uh, uh, this uh, symposium is a very tiny one, and I hope we can really change the policy and the whole landscape uh, in Hong Kong uh, in order we can receive uh, the aging population. Yes, with increasing age, uh, we do have more physical and mental health risk. Nowadays, 74% of the population who are 65 years old or above uh, suffer from one or more chronic diseases which include diabetes, hypertension, and stroke, etc. And it is estimated that the number of elders who suffer from diabetes will be half a million, hypertension will be 1.3 million, and stroke will be 100,000 in the year of 2058. And mental health risk include suicide, dementia, depression, loneliness, and there are no firm statistics as the number of uh, Hong Kong people suffering from dementia yet, but uh, the estimate is around 100,000 now. But we expect to triple this uh, in the year of uh, 2039. Uh, uh, and we have, an, on average, one older people killed by themselves every day in Hong Kong. Every day, one elderly will commit suicide in Hong Kong. And this rate is one of the highest in the world and surpass other age blanket in Hong Kong. Why? Because a lot of them are living alone. And loneliness is regarded by WHO as the biggest epidemic of the world and loneliness kills. Not only by depression induced suicide, but also other chronic diseases. 
And apart from the implication on physical and mental health, increasing in age also implies the increasing difficulty in mobility. A researcher just two years ago shows that the ADL, which is the activities of daily living, including eating, toileting, transferring from a bed to a chair, and etc. And also IADL, which is uh, instrumental activities of daily living, performing simple day-to-day -day tasks like meal preparation, doing some banking or shopping. And both the ADL and the IADL impairment increase with age. And the gradient of that increase was steeper in the age groups beyond the age of 70. So it's, it's not really old, uh, will affect the mobility. So that means more and more of us will require some sort of assistance in moving around in the city. And there are numerous studies that illustrate the relationship between built environment and health or health risk, say obesity. Also, an inclusive environment brings people together and helps to build social network, keeping people from loneliness and depression. I will talk more about how neighborhood affects health and interact the phenomenon of loneliness and also the difference between universal and assess accessible design, illustrating how environment shapes behavior. Researchers from Hong Kong U and University of Oxford has used big data to show how the built environment has direct impacts on physical activity and on people's health. In, in general. They have studied the impact of over half a million people living in 22 cities in UK and, with, and we're prepared to do the same in Hong Kong and mainland China. So we are looking forward to the research in Hong Kong. It's, it was found that the people living in denser city centers are less obese since working, living and socializing are brought people closer together. It tends to promote more walking and cycling thus cutting down on car travels. Moreover, there tends to be more social interaction and easy access to health care, which is better for health in general. However, when cities become too crowded, the positive health effects will tail away. The presence of green space also shows positive linkage to health. Oh, I think this is the old slide, but anyway, I will talk on it, so just listen to me. And greenery within 500 meters of one's home was associated with less obesity and more walking. And recently, researchers also demonstrated a very strong association between neighborhoods' walkability and lower blood pressure and incidence of hypertension. And with these findings, the intangible value of urban design in improving long-term health outcomes has turned into a tangible factor in urban design. So I hope this, uh, the agenda of health can really uh, put in all our urban design. As I just mentioned, loneliness can impair health. A lack of social connection can spark inflammation and changes in the immune system. So lonely people are far more likely to die prematurely. Loneliness is more dangerous than obesity and is about as deadly as smoking. So putting people together is insufficient to deal with the problem. We have to provide social support and connect people to build relationship networks. Feeling lonely was linked to a 64% increase in the risk of developing dementia. So, the challenge of urban planners and designers is to build, to connect people. Universal design is to design for all residents throughout their life. The key is to provide convenience and safety for different people with different needs. There are eight goals of universal design. Body fit accommodating a wide range of body size and abilities, for example, the signage. Comfort, keeping demands within desirable limits of body function, for example, the restroom, uh, sized for uh, different people. Awareness, ensuring the critical information for use is easily perceived. Understanding, using intuitive, clear, and unambiguous methods of operation. For example, the signage and also the wayfinding cues. 
wellness, contributing to health promotion, avoidance of disease and prevention of injury. Social integration, which is very important. Treating all groups with dignity and respect. Personalization. And also finally, cultural appropriateness. Uh, so we cannot copy the single type of uh, universal design uh, to Hong Kong. We need to customize our own according to our culture. Unlike accessibility modification, universal design does not simply cater for people with disabilities by adding on barrier-free facilities that are out of the way of all other people. Since this essentially single people with disabilities out from the mass. Rather than segregation, universal design takes up the challenge to design for all people, including the needs of individuals affected by disability, while ensuring that the design is appealing and useful for everyone. So this approach to design requires the involvement of a diversity of user opinion from the first step. The conception of design the universal design is also a collaborative and accommodating process. So the process of designing is also important, not only the product. And so it is far more than guidelines. It's we, we should see from the angle of people see. These are some examples of uh, universal design. I won't go into it in detail. And uh, this is the home modification done by our uh, housing authority. And for elderly residents and those with dis uh, physical disabilities, the universal design feature sometimes may not be sufficient. But the beauty of it is it can be easily tailor-made for people with need. And typical improvement works include widening of the unit's uh, entrance with provision of a ramp uh, wherever practical be, and conversion of a bathtub into a shower area installation of some grab rails and provision of uh, foldable doors at bathroom, etc. And <clears throat> I'll come to uh, this uh, double dose things uh, for this afternoon. And uh, for those, if you miss the Kampon uh, MOT presentation by uh, our Singaporean friend, uh, I will see from a Hong Kong perspective of uh, how this uh, should uh, affect our design in Hong Kong. Campon MOT received actually the best commercial mixed-use future project award uh, at the uh, World Architecture Festival. And so it is a very nice one. And uh, actually, I don't know whether Singaporean friends uh, told you or not, the, the meaning of Campon. Did she? No. So uh, Campon is a Malay word, means a village. So it basically it's a uh, is uh, MOT Village. And you know what? It was um, very like the old times in Hong Kong. The living conditions were bad for the poorest working class who lived in the squatter huts below the Lion Rock in the old times, in the slum area. Slum area. However, in those areas, in those kampong, like in Hong Kong, the mutual help, the social capital, the connectivity between people were very strong, and people are forced to be connected by the environment. And similar to the old Hong Kong Lion Rock spirit, Kampong MOT make good use of social capital, mutual help, well, five minutes, so I need to speed up, and support as a village, but without the bad hygiene and lack of uh, medical and social uh, support. In Kampong MOT, a vertical Village is devised with a people plaza in the lower stratum, a medical center in the mid stratum, and a community park with studio apartment for seniors in the upper stratum. So basically, it is a senior housing project built for inclusion, not for exclusiveness. And this is the key point. And the design is to generate activities, not to prohibit activities from happening. Many of time in Hong Kong, our design is prohibit people from doing many different kinds of things. And for older person, just seeing activities happening is a joy, is an enjoyment for them. And to support intergenerational bonding, complementary programs such as uh, child care and senior care centers are located side by side. Bring, bringing together young and old 
to live, to eat, and to play. The close proximity to healthcare, social and commercial, and other amenities supports and promotes active aging in place. The People's Plaza, as I just mentioned, is a fully public, polished, and pedestrian-friendly ground area, designed as a community living room for communal space and events. Within this welcoming and inclusive space, the public can participate in organized events, join in the season's festival, shop or eat at the hawker center on the uh, second story. And I'm so surprised to see a public space which is really inviting. Actually, the design intentionally draws people from nearby estates, MTR station, and even visitors like me. And the community park at the top stratum is an elevated village, green, where residents can actively come together to exercise, chat, or tend their community farms to explore meanings and purpose of life. And I also found a lot of different kinds of fruit trees uh, were planted, which are basically rare species in Hong Kong public space. Uh, apparently, uh, the administrator there are not caring about the ease of administration. They care about the residents more. The unit obviously adopts the universal design principles. And it is also a, a dementia-friendly compound. Even the supermarket is dementia friendly. For example, the staff are trained to serve customers who suffer from dementia, who are living in the senior housing. But mind you, the supermarket is open for the public at the same time. So it's all inclusive. The compound concept of urban design draw me to the final notes. So uh, I'm coming to my conclusion. That's the basic, what's the basic purpose of urban design. What's the basic purpose of urban design? According to the town planning ordinance in Hong Kong, it is to promote health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the community. However, in reality, I find it, to my opinion, commercial development and efficiency are top priorities. An example that policy shapes environment is the Cross Bay Link, Zhang Kuan O, which connects Zhang Kuan O Lam Tin Tunnel to Wan Po Road, actually is the industrial area. The project includes an approximately 1.8 kilometers long dual two-link bridge spanning in front of the beautiful Zhang Kuan O waterfront, if you went there before. This was planned during my tenure in Sai Kong District Council. At that time, I was a district councillor there. A standard efficient cross-bay bridge was obviously being proposed by my colleague to carry the vehicles from point A out of the tunnel to point B, the industrial area. Very efficient way. But I saw the huge potential of making it a health-promoting landmark and also a people connector for all the Jungkwano residents. By linking the cycle track and the footpath along the waterfront with this bridge, a four to five kilometer circuit will be formed. This beautiful circuit will change the behavior of the residents living nearby, moving them from their couches to cycle or jog along the track. Of course, I was told by my colleagues in the planning department that the building cost will be much higher, building in the cycle path and also the track. But my argument is people will be happier healthier, and the social cost for healthcare and social services will be much lower and very soon, and this will be offset. So fortunately, all agree with my plan. And now we are going to have the first long bridge in Hong Kong with health and well-being in mind. So policy can really change the environment. And uh, I will... Uh, just briefly, give me one, one minute uh, to tell you how this can be done. Actually, in the Hong Kong 2030 Plus, uh, our design framework, it is to promote an inclusive and supportive city and to build balanced communities and also to promote an age-friendly built environment. And I would say we can do a bit more uh, by uh, 
uh, incorporating three important concepts into it. First, housing for the elderly. And we have the highest percentage of our elderly living in different kinds of OH homes in the world. 7% of our elderly are living in OH homes. And we have, if we have appropriate housing for them, I can assure you that more than half, at least half of them, can stay out of the nursing home because nobody would like to spend their years in the nursing homes. So we should promote housing choices across all sectors and explore cohabitation models, including co-living between the young and the elderly. So stay tuned. Tomorrow, I will, you will see me in the TV documentary and uh, promoting a co-living between the young and the old. I visit uh, Alicante in Spain. So, uh, so please uh, watch it. And we can build more of this. We can even build hostel for different age group of the elderly so that they can live together. They can co-live, they can connect. And I will skip the universal design. I suppose there are enough uh, designers here uh, who know this uh, subject. So I will come to this really my final slide. The whole city should be built for health promotion and also with, for people with various mobility. Our existing city is very much built for exclusiveness and privacy. We have enough estate and beautiful houses that we cannot assess, with a lot of public space which are not in inviting, not welcoming. And we should change our whole mindset. It's time for us to rethink, do we long for a life of loneliness? when we all age. Bear with me for the last time. An age-friendly city enables people of all ages to actively participate in community activities and treats everyone with respect, regardless of their age. So I really believe policy shapes environment, environment shapes behavior, and behavior shapes how we age. We all don't want to be lonely when we age. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lam. Please be seated. Thanks very much.